So today, I want to show you two great demos um, that show you what you can do with the Genie network. And um, assuming they work as, uh, as we hope they do, uh, this actually should be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit about the Genie network. When Genie originally started, it started with a simple idea, which was to create a virtual laboratory for exploring the future internet at scale. Well, how do we build such a laboratory? It seems like at a very minimum we need two things. First, we need server PCs to generate the traffic. Uh, second, we need switches that form a network that connects these PCs. And then we need a way how we can control the hosts and the network uh, for researchers that want to run the experiments. So for PCs, there's a number of fairly good solutions that exist today. For example, you can take Planet Lab. Uh, with Planet Lab, you can take a PC, you can virtualize it. Uh, you can then get one of the virtual machines on the PC. You can run an experiment on it. The virtual machines are isolated. Uh, it works great in practice. But how do we do it for a network? So the first idea that we had was to say, look, we have PCs already. Can't we take the PCs and use them as routers and switches? And it turns out uh, a software router, which is essentially a PC with a number of networking cards, um, that makes a pretty good router and works for a number of applications. But we also found that for some of the experiments that we wanted to run, we ran into limitations. And let me explain to you why. So what you see here is a fairly cheap, modern uh, 10 gigabit switch, a high density 10 gigabit switch. It has 48 ports. Uh, each port runs at 10 gigabits per second. So the total switching capacity of the switch is around 480 gigabits per second. If you compare this switch with a software router, a software switch, a uh, software router, software switch typically maxes out somewhere in the order of 5 gigabits per second. Now there's some experiments for which this factor of about 100 in performance uh, doesn't matter. But we found that for some of the experiments that we wanted to do, this difference in scale was a real problem. This is a little bit like if you're trying to try out a next generation race car, which is going 190 miles per hour, and the maximum speed which you can go at is only two miles per hour. You obviously can practice driving with that, but for example, you want to figure out aerodynamics, reduce the drag of your car. Um, that's something which you couldn't do with this scenario. So the second thing that we tried was to say, maybe we can build our own switch and routers. Maybe we can use custom hardware. And uh, looking back, I think this turned out a lot harder uh, than we had originally expected. So the first problem is, it's really, really hard to build your own router or switch. If you look at how much industry spends to build a new generation of router or switch, it's typically at the order of $50 million to get from nothing to, to, to a fully working system. Um, in academia, $50 million, that's a lot of, lot of money. But even if we can do it, it would take us several years to build the system, and we'd be always lagging behind industry by a number of years. That's always not what we want. The second problem that we found was that the resulting systems are actually very hard to program. Um, if you look at the CPU that's in, typically in a, in a modern you know, one use switch, uh, it tends to be an embedded system. It's like a power PC running at 600 megahertz or something like that. Um, it has very limited memory, has typically a small flash file system, and your, your programming is done very, very close to the hardware. It's not an easy environment to do any work in. It's, it's much, much harder than, say, programming on a, uh, on a modern Linux server. So that didn't, didn't, wasn't particularly interesting either. But the biggest problem was deploying custom hardware at scale. It gets very, very expensive. Um, if, you, if you build your own hardware, you typically end up with a cost per port that's, that's over $1,000. It's, it's difficult to get much below that. Uh, at $1,000, let's do a little thought experiment here. We currently have in Spiral 2 something in order of, I think, 50 universities participating um, in Genie. If you take 50 universities and assume you just want to take a single building in each university, say 1,000 ports, want to, want to enable them for Genie, and we do it with custom hardware, then the result would be, if you run the numbers, it would cost something in the order of $50 million, just for the pure hardware, not counting any of the OPEX cost for deployment. And that's a lot of money for what we're trying to do here. So at the end, we came to a very simple conclusion, which is the only test network that's really large enough to evaluate future internets at scale is the internet itself. The internet is so large, it's just not cost effective to build another one from scratch. What that meant is that we need a radically different approach. We basically need to find a way how we can take existing routers, existing switches, existing links, and enable them for research. So how do we do that? The first thing that we had to do is we had to take, make routers and switches programmable. And uh, the technology we're using for this is called OpenFlow. Um, it basically takes the control plane, takes it out of the switch or router, moves into an external server, so we're separating control and data plane. And uh, 
Many of you have heard us talk about OpenFlow about 15 times uh, at this point, so I'm not going to go into the details again here. But the, the basic idea is we add a little bit of software to the software that's already running, on typically an otherwise unchanged switch. And with this extra little bit of software, this switch can now be operated by an external controller. And basically, this external controller has full control of what the switch does in real time. But making the switch programmable alone wasn't enough. For Genie, we also wanted to have a way how we can slice the network. And the tool we built in order to do this is called Flowvisor. Many of you know it. What basically Flowvisor is, it's a virtualization proxy. I can take a number of switches, like, let's just take one switch, connect it to Flowvisor, and then Flowvisor can, take to multi can connect to multiple OpenFlow controllers. That way, each experimenter can run their own OpenFlow controller, and the experiments can run in parallel, and Flowvisor isolates them one, one uh, from the other. With OpenFlow and Flowvisor, we were now able to take a network and divide it up into slices. If an experimenter wants to run an experiment, the experimenter takes a slice, configures the slice, connects it to his own controller, run, and basically now he can do in this slice whatever he wants. He has complete control of a packet forwarding at a, at a, sort of in real time at a verifying granularity. Um, but the infrastructure makes sure this slice is isolated from other slices. So if I'm running experiments, my experiment goes horribly wrong, and somebody else is running an experiment, that experiment doesn't shut down. Um, we then took uh, the opt-in manager and uh, Expedian and integrated this uh, Flowvisor and OpenFlow uh, into the Genie control framework. And that's what we have available today. So this is sort of the rough blueprint that we had in mind two years ago when we sort of started out in this journey. And looking back, I think it's been a huge success. The first thing we needed to do is find OpenFlow-enabled hardware. And for this, we went to switch vendors and started working with them. And they're great partners. Um, today, we have OpenFlow running on a number of switches. This includes HP Procurve, uh, NEC, uh, Pronto, which is a Quanta OEM switch, uh, and Netgear, most recently. And these four are just the switches that are basically running in, uh, in test topologies today. Uh, in total, I think OpenFlow has been demonstrated on over 12 different switching hardware platforms. Once we had the switches, we started deploying OpenFlow. We start through the Genie Trials program. We basically talked to a number of universities, and today we have OpenFlow installations running um, at Stanford University in California, University of Washington in Seattle, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, Indiana University at Bloomington, at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, at Clemson University in South Carolina, at Princeton University in Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, for this demo, I think for the first time, we also have uh, an OpenFlow network at Kansas State University, uh, and uh, there's an OpenFlow island at BBN in Boston. And once we had all these different OpenFlow islands in place, we connected them together with uh, OpenFlow-enabled switches um, in the National Lambda Rail Internet 2 backbones. So today, we have a still fairly small uh, OpenFlow-enabled uh, uh, Genie test network, uh, but it spans the continent from coast to coast. So what we want to show you now are two demos that run on this infrastructure. Um, the first one, uh, for the first one, I'd like to welcome Nikhil Handigold on the stage. And uh, one last request. If you have a cell phone, could you take out your cell phone? Because uh, we'll ask you to use it in just a second. Thanks.